Welcome to Finance Diva 2021 CEO and Founder Talks. Hani Rashwam, CEO and co-founder of 21 Shares, is, ha is here with us today to give us an update to his company and forecast on the world of cryptocurrencies. Hani, welcome. Great to have you here today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Your life is pretty uh, amazing. I'm so impressed because you just uh, grew up in... You grew up in Egypt and then you moved to the US and then you just made it to the top 30, under 30 in the Forbes list. How did you do that and what's your success <laughs> secret? <laughs> um, I don't know that I would uh, call myself successful just yet. I think I'm working on becoming successful. Um, it's quite early. I think the Forbes 30 under it was, was a great honor, but... Um, I remember the first thing I worked on, the first thing I programmed on, I was uh, maybe 11 years old. Uh, I think the first okay thing that I produced, I was maybe 13. So by the time that, you know, 10 years, 13 years later, there's the Forbes 30 under, uh, it took a lot of work. It took over a decade of work. Um, in terms of startup companies, I, I started my first one when I was 19 or 20 years old. Uh, and it was an epic failure. Uh, a lot of things went wrong. I learned a lot from, I, I learned a lot more from my mistakes at the time than my successes because there were no successes. Um, and it wasn't until my uh, second company that things started to look a little bit better. So I would say it took a very long time and a lot of hard work um, and determination and a lot of obstacles. Um, but sometimes you just see the honor at the end or the award at the end and think it's an overnight thing, but it, it very much wasn't. As a student, you already founded several companies and finally managed to have Tim Drapers to invest in your company. How did you convince Silicon Valley's top venture capital firm to give you money? <laughs> um, so I've, I've always been in, very interested in fintech. So I think I specialized in that field very early on. I was doing, uh, I was doing payments even as a teenager. Uh, and so I, I started knowing a little bit more about the industry and investors, I think, appreciate uh, domain expertise more and more. Uh, Tim, in, to his credit, is a bit of a crazy investor who really wants to bet on big ideas. Uh, it's no wonder that he's one of the biggest supporters uh, of Bitcoin and crypto assets, for example. Uh, and so similarly to that, I think it was a mixture of my uh, youthful exuberance, uh, some domain expertise and very big vision that ultimately made him uh, want to back this horse and see where it goes. Uh, and to be very fair, in the case of that first company, it didn't go anywhere good. Uh, it wasn't until the second company, which he also invested in, uh, that things started to look more positive. Arnold Schwarzenegger moved to America alone with just a gym bag to become a millionaire. Is it easier to get rich in the US than in Europe? And if yes, why? <laughs> um, <clears throat> bit of an awkward question to ask me since I decided to build my third company in Europe. Uh, and definitely not the US. Um, I think America has a lot of benefits when it comes to entrepreneurship. Uh, a huge amount of that is just the culture. Uh, there are aspects of Europe that make a company significantly easier to build from a product perspective. Just a very easy example. <clears throat> In Europe, the market is much larger, even though it's fractured. But because of European Union regulations, a, a bank company like Revolut could set up in just one member state, like Lithuania in their case, and then passport across the rest of the 28 countries. Uh, whereas in, in the United States, not only are you unable to do that, but with certain regulations like money transmitter licenses, you need to get them state by state, um, as well as DC, as well as Puerto Rico, et cetera. And so that can become much more difficult from a practical perspective sometimes um, to do something in America than in Europe. But where America, I think, really benefits over Europe is that startups and entrepreneurship are just much more accepted. Um, it's okay for, for me in America to come up and say, I did this company and I spent years on it and it failed. And people take that as a badge of honor. It's, uh, you, you failed 
therefore you've learned, therefore you'll succeed next. And investors like Tim Draper could have lost everything on my first company and still bet on me again, straight away on the second company because they acknowledged that initial uh, failure uh, as a um, success with, with respect to learning, with respect to experience. And I think this is something that we miss here in Europe. I think the concept of you can quit your job, you can try everything, you can absolutely fail, and that won't affect society's look on you or view on you, that's not here yet. And, and so as a result, <clears throat> I think people are a little bit more careful uh, and a little bit more orchestrated, which of course takes away from um, the crazy things you need to do in order to do entrepreneurship successfully. You are the co-founder of 21 Shares. How did you get your business started and who came up with the name 21 Shares? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, my co-founder and I, uh, we had, I think back in 2017, um, starting in 2017, uh, culminating in 2018, a few of our friends and family members started to uh, become very interested in Bitcoin and crypto and they wanted to invest some money into it. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, from, uh, I'm from Egypt uh, and my co-founder is Italian, although we both grew up um, a, a, a large amount of our lives in America, uh, but we had in the back of our minds sort of an idea on um, inflation, fiscal policies, uh, storing things in gold or dollars as, as our societies do that often. And Bitcoin was very attractive and, and Ethereum and smart contracts were very attractive to invest in. Um, and it wasn't just us, it was family members, it was friends, like I was saying, but they weren't very comfortable with setting up their own crypto wallets, uh, which could, of course, be easily lost or stolen if you weren't careful. They weren't comfortable with buying the cryptos on crypto exchanges, which at the time were either hard to use or prone to hacks. Um, we thought there's a huge amount of people outside of our family and friends who very strongly believe in Bitcoin, very strongly believe in crypto and they want to invest, but um, they want to invest in a way that is similar to how they've always invested before. And so we, we set about um, uh, packaging crypto assets in structures like ETPs that are already familiar to these investors that already work with the systems that these investors are already comfortable with. Um, we started then listing them on the biggest stock exchanges, setting up professional custody so that the investors don't have to worry about storage, um, making sure that it's insured so that they get that extra comfort, building it with professional market makers uh, so they know that the spreads are low and they're not being gouged by fees and so on. And that was the basic idea there is to build easier bridges and easier access in a way that is already familiar to these end investors. Um, with respect to the name, we wanted to keep it easy. Uh, we wanted to, since the beginning, since we operate already uh, in multiple languages, we wanted it to translate into different languages quite easily. Uh, so we thought that uh, there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoins ever created. That's part of the uh, selling uh, premise of, of Bitcoin. That's the maximum supply. And we make cryptos as easy as buying a share. So 21 shares, or since we operate in multiple languages, I've heard Einon Svansik shares, Ventuno shares, Ventian shares, et cetera, et cetera. Speaking of Germany, many finance companies register their business in countries such as Malta or Liechtenstein or Switzerland. What is Germany doing wrong? <laughs> um, I'm a positive person. I think Germany is doing a lot right. Uh, I think that uh, we can speak about Malta and, and Switzerland and other countries that are um, trying to take market share from Germany. But as it stands, uh, London is number one, Berlin is number two, right? And it's, it's, been, it's been that way for many, many years. Um, we have a very specific reason why we're in Switzerland. Uh, for us, uh, we needed a jurisdiction that understood crypto, that accepted it very early. We launched, we launched our products on Deutsche Börse, on, on Cetra, just last year in the summer of 2020. Uh, we launched our products in Switzerland in the fall of 2018. So we couldn't have listed in Germany because Germany at the time wasn't accepting of crypto assets, whereas 
uh, Switzerland in, in crypto specifically wanted to uh, portray themselves as crypto nation and crypto valley. Uh, and so I think that there's a lot of, um, of very specific reasons why jurisdictions like Switzerland have jumped ahead with respect to crypto. But overall, I would still say more fintech companies are started in, in Germany than, um, than started in Switzerland. Obviously, uh, Germany can do a lot of things better. We can all improve in, in numerous ways. It's a little bit difficult for me as, as I've never built a company in Germany uh, to really you know, comment too deeply on that. But I would say that there is a playbook of um, very good policies that startups need in order to uh, succeed and in order to have a viable ecosystem. And I would say um, San Francisco, New York, London have done a very good job of ensuring that um, you know, uh, startup employees can take equity in the companies and that be treated very uh, easily as well as uh, in a good manner by the tax authorities. Um, that you're allowed to uh, give employees these liquidity events in a way that is advantageous to them, that um, fosters more long-term thinking so that you can build value over the long-term, that you can have um, grants and an ecosystem of angel investments that are treated pretty well by the authorities in order to foster that community, uh, that you can have collaborations with universities and technical institutions so that you can keep doing that supply uh, so that you can have easier immigration, a, a topic that uh, is, is actually a concern in other European countries like Switzerland, where it is very difficult to immigrate. If you find a wonderful engineer from, say, the United States, they can't easily come to Zurich to, to work on your, um, on, on your application, but they can actually more easily move to Berlin. They can very easily move to London. Uh, and I think there are a few things there in the startup playbook uh, that governments can make uh, in that the governments can make easier for companies, and that will foster more more company growth. And I would say, just by the numbers, uh, Berlin is already doing a good number of those. Your company, Twenty One Shares, is a leading provider of so-called crypto products like ETNs. What's the difference between an ETF and a ETN? <laughs> um, I think that. I, I'm a big fan of just keeping it very simple. We make cryptos as easy to buy as a share. I don't think the end investors, the vast majority of them, really look at the stock exchange and want to pick an ETN over an ETF, over an ETC, over an ETI, over whatever. Um, the, the product we sell are very easy packages for crypto assets that are done in a safe, affordable way. That's it. Uh, beyond that, depending on which regulator we're speaking to, sometimes they call them different names. Um, ETPs is the umbrella term in most of the world, right? It's the category. Um, in Switzerland, ETPs are what we call both ETCs and ETNs, which is just confusing, which is why I don't like getting into it too much. But in Switzerland, um, our products are treated like exchange traded commodities. Uh, we have in fact built the product off of how the Swiss have uh, custodied and traded gold, physically backed gold. So it's identical to sort of an exchange traded commodity. Um, in Germany, we're treated like an exchange traded note. There are other jurisdictions where we're working on where, where we'll be treated as an exchange traded fund. Uh, but again, to the end investor, they're looking for something safe. They're looking for something affordable. And in whatever package we can build it based on local regulations, we will. If you're interested uh, to, to the link, I will post it under this video. Then you can find the products of 21 shares. Matthias, Very, go on. 21 shares, 21 shares .com. It's super easy. And Thank we have you. content in German, Italian, French, and English. Yeah. Honey, I have to congratulation to you and to 21 shares. Uh, this is really uh, such an exciting company and your products. Uh, as you mentioned before, you were the first mover into the DACH market for Germany, uh, Austria, and Switzerland uh, to, um, um, to come out with such product, uh, the easy way to buy Bitcoin, for example, for the, for the whole institutional uh, clients and so on. But uh, I'm interested in what the selection criteria, you mentioned Stellar and Cardano. So what selection criteria does a crypto value have to bring to be used 
uh, as an ETP uh, from 21 shares. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you. Uh, I, I still feel like we are at the very beginning and it's, we're just getting started, uh, but it's good to get some uh, early indications. Um, with respect to our selection criteria, it's a mix of things. Uh, we want to only allow um, investable assets because we give access to inv uh, investors, both retail and institutional. So we want to make sure that these assets are investable and um, professional and not scams. Beyond that, we don't make, <clears throat> and we do this very much on purpose, we don't make too many subjective choices. So this isn't about what we are recommending. This isn't what we um, think is you know getting our badge of approval or, or or something like that we just make sure that they are professionally structured that the teams behind them are real uh that they're not scams that they have a interesting infrastructure an interesting story uh and then we give access to the end investors some of this sometimes can come from investor requests so in the case of stellar uh, and Cardano, for example, we've received a lot of investor requests over the past uh, month or so in investing in these. Um, some family offices, some private banks, some retail uh, wanted safe ways of putting money into Cardano, for example, which has had a very good rise um, in attention and price uh, over the last couple of months. And therefore, we believe that um, we should offer you a good vehicle and a good bridge to that uh, asset. Great, great. Uh, maybe you tell us what, what are the next, uh, which currency do you have in the pipeline? A lot, a <laughs> lot. Um, I think we would like to launch um, another 15 to 20 uh, crypto assets. I think the... Um, um, what period I, of time? For many reasons, I'm prohibited uh, over the next one or two quarters, hopefully. Oh. Um, I think I'm prohibited... Uh, too much from going into the specifics here, but I think the list is obvious, right? Uh, we would like to um, allow uh, investors access uh, to a lot of these new innovations, whether they be um, the uh, new and burdening asset class that is uh, DeFi or whether it's some of the other crypto assets that are coming up. Um, one thing I will say is that um, I think over time, this concept of crypto finance will be um, will be adjusted. The, the crypto word will just be dropped and in 10 or 20 years, crypto finance will just be finance. Uh, and I think that off of that, it will surprise a, a few people uh, that some of our next products will seem like they're not crypto. Um, they're not backed by actual crypto assets because they will look a lot more like traditional products that one buys for, um, you know, commodities or currencies or traditional equities or things like that. But uh, they will either be faster or better or cheaper because in the background, they will have been built on top of crypto infrastructure. And so uh, not only are we moving into more of the crypto assets that, that we want to give investors access to, but we'll also build some traditional products in a crypto way that I think will offer investors a very compelling uh, new um, option that I don't think a lot of people are considering yet. Great, great. So you mentioned the the, 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 the basket, crypto basket, crypto indices yeah. uh, are also in everyone's mouth. Um, I think there are some uh, tax uh, problems, uh, unattractive because of rebalancing systems. How does the, the, the basket um, uh, of 21 shares does? Yeah, uh, I think we are very early in our development. Um, optimizing tax policy country by country is a very difficult thing for us as a firm to do. Um, therefore, we don't really do it. We would say um, there, are, there are jurisdictions where tax um, on crypto is either more advantageous or more disadvantageous, but we would recommend people speak to their own local um, authorities or, um, you know, tax lawyers or professionals on their specific situations. We can't really comment too much on, on any of those specifics, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. Uh, the cryptocurrency space is going uh, in, in, an, in a tremendously uh, fast, uh, uh, um, uh, fast time uh, timetable. 
Um, it's very hard to uh, have an overview of every single uh, cryptocurrency project. I'm starting to think in categories, but in category thinking is also a very hard uh, because uh, what do you think? Is it uh, reliable to think in a regulatory category or is it better to think in a technical category? I would say, uh, I would say categories are a big, um, a, a very good idea. I think of them in categories myself. Um, I think that it's, it's part of our uh, humanity when we made up languages that we've, you know, categorized things and, and we thought about things and themes. And I think that's a very good way of organizing your thoughts. Uh, like I said, I, it's, it's no longer going to be crypto finance. This is just finance. And when you think about how this affects banking, insurance, uh, risk, prediction markets, now art, uh, auctions, uh, middlemen, escrow agents. There's too much. We should categorize some of them. Um, my favorite categories are, broadly speaking, crypto assets can be currencies. Uh, think about the digital dollar, the digital euro, uh, or sometimes things like Bitcoin Cash or uh, Litecoin that, that you know they sell their ability to be used for payments, for example. Um, they can be smart contract platforms where you can build an ecosystem on top of it. Um, and that's where things like Ethereum or Solana or Cardano or any, anything that wants to build an ecosystem on top of it can be. And there are crypto commodities, things that um, operate more like gold. And of course, the biggest example there is the digital gold that is Bitcoin. Um, off of that, I think there are also uh, DeFi, which by itself is a really exciting area. You could put it under smart contracts, and I don't think that would be wrong. Or you could put it in another category on its own because it's so massive, and that wouldn't be wrong either. Uh, and of course, now you also have NFTs, which are very early, very exciting. Um, some risk, obviously. So uh, be, you know, be careful and don't invest more than um, you should. Uh, but the concept of NFTs and the, and the and the very intelligent people that are working in them and backing them shows that there is something uh, there in the long term, even if in the short term, uh, maybe people are getting a little bit too excited. <laughs> great, great. Personally, Annie, my last question, what do you expect uh, once the US is allowing to offer Bitcoin ETF and when? Um, I think if you look at the US, uh, it's been working on this for, for quite some time. Um, I can't comment very specifically as, of course, we as a firm are constantly in communication with many regulators around the world. But what I can say is that in our conversations with regulators that haven't yet allowed our products, um, they're extremely intelligent. They're on top of it. They're looking to allow investors access to these in a safe way. And I think we'll get there. And I hope we get there soon um, in a number of different areas. America is obviously a very large market uh, and a very important market. And so once an American Bitcoin ETF is, is put out there, I think it will have a very positive effect on the ecosystem. It will make it more accepted uh, globally. Uh, I think that we have always had an interest in being available in multiple jurisdictions and multiple places. So it doesn't change our plans too much. Uh, if anything, I think a, an American Bitcoin ETF will convince a number of other jurisdictions around the world to allow their own uh, Bitcoin ETFs, which of course we will also be a part of. So um, can't, you know, can't dive too much into the specifics uh, or share any more information at this time. But I overall, I would say more regulators accepting Bitcoin and doing it in a safe way is a net positive for the entire crypto asset ecosystem, as well as the end investors. Cool. Thank you, Henny, for your interview, for your time. Of it course. was nice meeting you. And we hope you liked the video and leave us your comments underneath this video and hope to see you soon on finanzdiva.de and rette dein Geld. Bye-bye.